Thank you, CA. I can sing just like that. Good evening, everyone. I was expecting something to put my stuff on. Huh. All right, well, I guess I'll set it on the ground. Um, our presentation over the course of the next five meetings is going to be on the unknown God. And can you think of a passage in Scripture that comes to mind when I say that phrase, the unknown God? Is there anything that, does that ring a passage for you? Acts chapter 17, very good. Of course, in Acts chapter 17, Paul is there in what city? Does anyone remember? He was in the city of Athens, I heard someone say, and he was wandering around and he saw the various idols that were constructed and his heart was pained within him as he thought about these very intelligent, very sophisticated people. But in their sophistication and in their intelligence, they came to believe uh, that somehow their constructions and their idols and their buildings actually contained God and in some senses were gods or at least were representations of God. And in Paul's wanderings there around the uh, Athenian area, he saw this, this uh, phrase that, that said, to the unknown God on one of the idols, to the unknown God. And so when Paul stood there before the Areopagus at Mars Hill, he stood up and he said, I have a message from the unknown God for you. And uh, is it possible that for those of us, even within Christendom, we're not Greeks, we're not pagans, we believe the Bible, amen? amen. Is it possible that even for us, there is a sense in which God is unknown, one of the members of the Godhead? Well, I am persuaded that that is the case, and, and I'll just sort of start with a brief word of prayer, and then I'll do a simple little illustration that will sort of help us to get our minds wrapped around this idea of the unknown God. Let's just pray briefly. Father in heaven, what a privilege to be here this evening with these dear people, and Father, with those that are viewing through the uh, television or the computer screen or listening in on the radio, uh, we would ask that you'll be with us now. As we open Scripture, we would ask that you would open us. And we thank you for your love and mercy, and we claim the promise that your Spirit will guide us into all truth. In Jesus' name, amen. Ta-da! You see how that works? It reminds me one time, I probably shouldn't even tell you this story. I have two little boys, ages 9 and 10, and one time we were at the table, this was years ago, and I think I've repented of it since, and uh, there was a pizza sitting on the table, and I said, okay, boys, let's pray and thank Jesus for this pizza. And I really wanted to, like, make it clear to them that we were thanking God for the food that He had provided. So while they were praying, I secretly grabbed the pizza, and I moved it off the table, and I set it on the chair right beside me. And they opened up their eyes, and the pizza was gone. And I said, boys, where's the pizza? And they said, Papa, Papa, and they were quite young. Papa, Papa, where's the pizza? I said, I don't know. Let's pray that it'll come back. So they pray. They're like, Lord. Jesus, please bring back our pizza. We're really hungry. And while they were praying, I put the pizza back. When they opened their eyes, they're like, Papa, the pizza's here. So look, the pizza's here. So anyway, great. Thank you guys for bringing that out. I didn't want to put all my stuff on the floor. So here, let's start with this very simple exercise. We've got a lot of information to cover tonight and in subsequent nights and on Sabbath. So I, I want to get right into this. Okay, we're going to do just a very simple game, or maybe a game is the wrong word, an illustration where I'm going to say a word and then you're going to get a mental picture. Okay, simple. So if I say school bus, do you have something that comes into your mind? What color is it? Okay, of course, it's yellow. If I say baseball game, does something come into your mind? Okay, if I say, let's try something even, even a little more abstract. If I say warm, do you get a picture in your mind? Just a picture, a mental picture. Okay, so you're getting how this is working. Now, let's try this one. Father. When I say father, does something come into your mind? Do you have a mental picture? Okay, let's try this one. Son. Do you have a mental picture when I say son? Okay, so when I say baseball game, when I say bus, when I say warm, when I say father, when I say son, you're able to grab a mental picture that you can associate reasonably with that thing, right? So try this one. Holy Spirit. Do you have a mental picture? If you're anything like me, you really don't. Maybe you see some sort of vapor. Some, what, what, Holy Spirit, what? 
it's very much unlike a yellow school bus or a baseball diamond or a fireplace that would keep us warm. When Paul stood before the Athenians there and said, I bring to you a message from the unknown God, he of course wasn't referring just to the Holy Spirit. He was talking about the transcendence or the unknowability of God. Another word for this is the ineffability of God, the incommunicability of God. And there is a very real sense, even for those of us that are believers in Scripture, that there's a very real sense in which we know who the Father is. We have a mental idea, a mental conception, a picture of the Father. We've got that. We can understand the idea of a son. I was just telling you a moment ago that I have two sons, Landon and Jabel, 10 and 9. So when you say son, I see their faces. I see their pic- They just come into my mind. But when we say and when we think and when we talk about the Holy Spirit, do you find that it's difficult to know exactly what we're talking about? How many of you have had that experience before where you've thought, okay, so who exactly is the Holy Spirit and what exactly does He do and maybe what does He even look like? There are some in our ranks and there are some in the world, a great many in fact, who are what we would call non-Trinitarian monotheists. Now, let's just sort of unpack that a little bit. What do you think the phrase, what do you think the word monotheist means? What does that mean? They believe in one God, monotheos, theos. So, they believe in one God. So, people that are monotheists are people like the Muslims are monotheistic, and the Jews are monotheistic, and Christians are monotheistic, and there are other, uh, these are the primary monotheistic religions, but there are other um, instances of monotheism. But when we talk about non-Trinitarian monotheists, we're talking about people who believe, okay, now follow this carefully here, that God, right, the the God of the universe, the, the Creator God, the God that is out there is rigidly singular, okay? They're Unitarians. That would be one way of saying it. In fact, this is the central tenet of Islam, that there is only one God, Allah right? And Muhammad is his prophet. So, this idea that God is rigidly singular in the most emphatic sense of oneness, God is one. Do Christians believe in one God? Absolutely, no question. Christians affirm that God is one, and so in that sense we are monotheistic, But we do diverge very significantly from our non-Trinitarian monotheistic brothers and sisters because we say, yes, there is one God, but He is not rigidly singular in the absolute sense of oneness. God is three persons that comprise one God. Three persons, one God. Now, many of us, the moment we hear that, it's not easy to get our minds wrapped around the idea of three and one. One and three. And there's a word that we sometimes use to communicate this singularity and yet plurality. And what's the word? The word is Trinity. And uh, there are people that I have met all over the world who have a very serious, very um, significant objection to the use of the word Trinity. Trinity. They'll say things like, the word Trinity does not occur in the Bible. I have a question for you. Is that true? It is true. It's absolutely true. So they'll say, I'm not going to use the word Trinity because it doesn't occur in the Bible. So I have a simple question for you here. Is there anything um, particularly special or anything essential about the word Trinity? Yes or no? Are, are Are we married to that word? Do we have to use that word? No, we don't have to use that word at all. The word simply is a word that is trying to communicate what we were just discussing a moment ago, that God is singular in one sense and plural in another. It comes from tri, like a tricycle or a tripod, meaning three, and unity and divinity. So, three in one. Now, what we're going to do in our our time here today and especially tomorrow is we're going to try and unpack the biblical foundation for this idea that God is singular and yet plural. Are you with me on that? What's, our, what's this whole series called? What's that, what does that say back there? Anchors of what? Truth. And where would we get truth from? What, what is our definition of truth? We're, from, very good. Thy word is truth. Sanctify them through thy word. Thy word is truth. And so, 
we arrive at truth by a study of Scripture as Bible-believing Christians. Are you comfortable with that? Yes or no? Now, just a word on that. Some people say, we're not we reject the idea of the Trinity and we reject the use of the word Trinity because the word Trinity is Catholic. The idea of the Trinity is Catholic. And they say, if the Catholics believe it, it must be false and therefore we don't believe it. But I want to ask you a very simple question. At, at first, that sounds maybe mildly persuasive. I'll ask you a very simple question. Do we arrive at truth by a rejection of Catholicism or by an acceptance of Scripture? by an acceptance of Scripture, because our friends, the Catholics, teach many things that are absolutely true. For example, they teach that there's a God. Do you believe there's a God? Okay, so if we're going to reject everything that's Catholic wholesale, or everything that's Orthodox, or everything that's Protestant, or any, if we're going to reject something wholesale, we're going to find ourselves in a, in a bit of a pickle. We do not arrive at truth by a rejection of what someone else teaches, but by an acceptance of what Scripture teaches. Amen? So over the course of our time together, what we're going to try and do, especially in our first two presentations here, is we're going to try and lay a broad biblical foundation. A broad what, everyone? A broad biblical foundation for this idea that God is one and yet is also plural. In one sense, he is a singularity, and in another sense, he is a plurality. In fact, I think that's the title of our presentation tonight, The Mystery of God, Singularity and Plurality. Now, for ease of communication, for what words did I say, everyone? For ease of communication, we are going to use, probably sparingly, but we will employ the word trinity, but let's be very clear. Let me be very clear with you what I mean when I say that word. When I use the word, it means what I define it as meaning, not what somebody else defines it as meaning. Make sense? In fact, a friend of mine recently wrote a book. It's a small book, only about 900 pages. I'll show it to you tomorrow night on the Trinity. And his name is Glenn Parfit. He's an Australian, a scientist, and uh, really a wonderful, wonderful man. The book only took him 12 years to research and write, okay, so just a quick, just a quick little book he wrote, um, 900 short pages, and at the very beginning of that book, when, when Glenn is writing, he has to defend his use of the word Trinity. He has to defend his use. How else are we going to communicate this idea of God's singularity and yet God's plurality if we don't use some word, whatever that nomenclature, whatever that language is? And uh, I want to just say tonight what Glenn says right in the opening page of his book. So listen to this and tell me if you think this is the better part of wisdom. He writes, I would be happy not to use the word Trinity at all, as it does not occur in the Bible. Moreover, the word Trinity means different things to different people, and there are some statements made by Trinitarians with which I could not agree. I could therefore give the wrong impression by saying, I am a Trinitarian. On the other hand, because my beliefs fall within the range of beliefs generally regarded as Trinitarian, I would certainly give the wrong impression if I were to say, I am not a Trinitarian. For this reason, when I am asked, I have to confess that yes, I am a Trinitarian, and then do any explaining necessary. Does that sound reasonable to you, everyone? Very simple. So we will be using the term as we define it. What that, doesn't, what, that, what that basically protects us from then is somebody coming up with some strange, odd, weird, unbiblical definition that they find on the internet, because you know everything on the internet is true. Some strange, odd, weird definition on the internet of the Trinity, and then coming to me and saying, do you believe in the Trinity? And I say, yes. They say, well, you believe this. No, 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 no. That's not my definition. That might be someone's definition, but let me tell you what I believe. Now, I happen to be a member of a community of faith called Seventh-day Adventists, and Seventh-day Adventists have a single creed, and that creed is the Bible, the Bible and the Bible only, sola scriptura. Can you say amen to that? Amen. Very reasonable. What the Adventists have done, and I think it was the better part of wisdom, and I totally support this, is rather than having a creed, they have a series of statements that are called fundamental beliefs. It comes from the Latin word fundament, which just means foundation, okay? A series of foundational beliefs. These things are not 
set in stone in a creedal sense, where you have to say it just like we say it or you're not a member of our club. They're simply ways of articulating how we understand Scripture, what we think Scripture is teaching, and this is where we're at now. These are our beliefs. All that's inspired is Scripture. Amen? In fact, here's a very simple rule of, of thumb for all of us to always bear in mind. There are only two kinds of words in the universe, right, when it comes to these kinds of things. You have God's words, which are contained in Scripture, and then we have words about God's words, right? The words of theologians and expositors and preachers like myself. So, two kinds of words, God's words and words about God's words. Okay, now which is absolutely authoritative? God's words. And are these words authoritative? The answer is yes, in as much as they are in harmony with what? These words. We together, everyone, on that? Okay, so when I'm going to read you this very simple statement that my community of faith has said, this is what we believe, I think they've done a very good job. And it's going to sort of lay out for us as we start tonight, definitionally, the direction that we're going. Okay, and this is what's regarded as, or called, fundamental belief number two for the Adventist community. Anchors of truth. Now again, this is not a, an authoritative creedal statement. It's simply an articulation of what my community of faith believes the Bible is teaching. We together on that, everyone? Here we go. There is one God. We comfortable with that? We're going to be looking at that in just a moment. There is one God. There's the singularity. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. There's the what? plurality. Very good. There is one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, a unity of three co-eternal persons. God is immortal, all-powerful, all-knowing, above all, and ever-present. He is infinite beyond human comprehension, yet known through His self-revelation. He is forever worthy of worship, adoration, and service by the whole creation. That's the end. Now, when I read Scripture, and I've had the privilege of been, being a Christian now for 15 years, I've read the Bible many times, where I'm at right now today, what is today? January, whatever, 2012. Where I'm at right now, I think that that is a very accurate, very good articulation of what Scripture teaches. Are you with me on that? But the authority resides here, not in any words that any man says about Scripture. So far, so good? Okay, so now, let's get into Scripture. The first thing that we're going to do, even before we get in to the discussion on God's singularity and yet plurality, which is going to set the table for us to get into the unknown God, the Holy Spirit, which is going to be nights or sessions three, four, and five. So we've got to deal with this before we can deal with this. But before we can deal with this, the triune nature of God as singular and plural, we have to deal with something very fundamental right at the outset. And that is we have to recognize the limits of language. Let's all say that together. We have to recognize the limits of language, right? Every one of us in this room has had the experience before of trying to communicate something and, and it's not coming across to our listener. Is that true? And you do your very... In fact, just, it's so funny. Just last night, I was having a conversation with my wife and we got into a bit of an argument. Is that okay sometimes? I mean... Occasionally it happens. Uh, the, the, the sign of a good marriage is not whether or not you get into arguments, but how you deal with those arguments. Amen. So we were just, here's what happened. Short version, she got a speeding ticket. A speeding ticket. Ah! Just when our record was clear since September of last year. All tickets are in the past. It was like, it was like the jubilee, right? And then my lovely wife was driving a little bit too fast, and I, rather than being the gracious, understanding husband that I could have been and should have been, I got a little upset, and then she got a little defensive. But then I tried to say, sweetheart, I'm sorry, I, 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 and I was trying to communicate, and, and she felt like I had attacked her, and she was upset, and she felt like I wasn't understanding, and we had a lack of communication. Has that ever happened with you? Now, we, had, we, we made up, and we kissed, and everything's great. Because I said, sweetheart, we can't leave on this note because what happens if I die? What happens if my plane crashes? We can't leave like this. And so, yeah, I know. Okay, and then we, everything was great. <laughs> but the point is this. Communication is a tricky thing. 
to really get another human being to actually understand what it is you're saying is not an easy thing. And as a public communicator, I tell you, to get hundreds or thousands of people to try and understand what you're saying is no easy feat. Now, if I'm describing to you chocolate chip cookies or a baseball game or a school bus, language is going to do pretty well. So if I say yellow, you've got a picture. If I say tires, you've got a picture. If I say baseball mitt, you've got a picture. If I say baseball bat, you've got a picture. But when we start talking about God, language begins to show its limitations. It begins to show its not perfect ability, the inability to communicate things that are eternal, things that are ineffable, things that are incommunicable very quickly. So what we have to do any time that we talk about God is recognize that there are very serious and very significant limitations that language has when it comes to describing God and the things of God. Are we together on that, everyone? Okay. The temptation to go back to Paul standing before the Greeks who had crafted all of their statues and they had their pantheon of deities, the Greek temptation in Greek myth mythology was to, I'm going to give you a big word here, anthropomorphize. Have you ever heard that word before? Anthropomorphize or an anthropomorphism? Okay, it comes from two words, very simple. The word morph, which means to change, right? And anthropos, which means mankind. So an anthropomorphism is making something like man. Are you tracking with me? And we do this with our pets. You know, our little dog will come and say, oh, oh, he's so sad. No, he's not sad. I don't know what he is, but he's probably not sad. You see characteristics in that dog that look to you like human characteristics, and so you anthropomorphize, and you say, oh, if that was a human being, that would be called sadness, or that would be called gladness. I'm not saying that dogs can't experience some level of emotion. I think they can, but we do this. We, we give human characteristics to things that are not human. Now, sometimes that's appropriate, but when it comes to God, there's a slippery slope. What our Greek friends did is they imagined that, that God was like themselves, and so they made gods who sought revenge and who had malice and who had jealousy and envy and anger and etc. They made gods in their own image. These were anthropomorphisms where they basically turned God into something like themselves. Now, there are certainly passages in Scripture where God is, in His own language, communicating to us so that we can understand who and what He is in language that sounds very human. Are you with me like that? For example, the Bible says that God wrote the Ten Commandments on tablets of stone with His own finger. Okay, so we get the idea here. We get the idea. A finger. This is a, this is a human entity, a finger, part of a hand, part of an arm, part of a body, and God wrote with His own finger. It's not to say that He didn't do that. He may well have done that. But this is taking God and using human language to try and communicate what He's doing. These anthropomorphisms can be appropriate up to a point, okay? Now, I want you to imagine that up here on our platform, we'll be using this over and over again. I want you to imagine that there's a line right here, okay? What is there, everyone? There's a, actually, we'll do it even better. We'll just say there's a line right here because, in fact, there is a line right here. So, you see how the stage ends right here and beyond? There is no stage. Are we together on that? Okay. For those of you that have been to the ocean, you've stood on the shore and you've looked out and the ocean looks big or small? Right. It looks huge, doesn't it? You're standing here and you look out at the vastness of the ocean. Okay. I want you to have that picture in your mind. We're standing here at the edge of human language. Okay. This is the very edge of, of the very best and clearest articulation that human language can give us, English can give us. That's the only language that I speak, so I'm going to speak in English tonight. Um, the very closest and best articulation of who and what God is gets us here, but the point is this. There is still an infinity beyond, an, in, an eternity beyond of what God actually is. This is just really getting us headed in the right direction. But at some point, we, we come up to the sea and we say, wow, God is all of that beyond. Are you, are you with me on that, everyone? 
Now, there are many passages in Scripture that demonstrate this. Let's just look at a few of them. Um, come with me to Deuteronomy. Come with me to Deuteronomy. That's the fifth book of Scripture, Deuteronomy chapter 29. I'm going to go through these very quickly, so hopefully your fingers are feeling dexterous and quick. Deuteronomy chapter 29, and I'm going to read the very last verse of that chapter. Deuteronomy 29, verse 29. Deuteronomy 29, 29 says, The secret things belong to the Lord our God, but those things which are revealed belong to us and to our children forever, that we may do all the words of this law. Moses here demarcates between two things, the secret things and the revealed things. The revealed things are the things that God has shown us. That's what the word means. He has revealed them. He has disclosed them. Those things belong to us, and they take place within the limits of human language, right? Right here, all of this, Moses is saying, has been revealed, but there's an infinity beyond. There is an ocean beyond that, that we don't understand. The secret things have not been revealed to us. Who and what God is in His actual essence impenetrable, ineffable, incommunicable. So we, we need to just be clear right up front that all of the language that we're going to use, all of the analogies that we're going to use, they have limitations, inherent limitations, because human language has limitations. Amen, everyone? Okay, another uh, passage of Scripture, just a couple more to this effect. Notice with me the book of Job. Join me in Job 11. We'll stay in the Old Testament here for just a moment. Job 11. And verse 7, Job 11, verse 7. Job 11, verse 7 says, Can you search out the deep things of God? That's very much in keeping with our ocean metaphor here. Can you search out the deep things of God? Can you find out... Now, what does your Bible say? The limits of the Almighty. And obviously, the question is asked in a rhetorical sense. Can you? And the answer, the implied answer is what? Of course not. Verse 8, they are higher than heaven. What can you do? Deeper than Sheol. What can you know? Their measure is longer than the earth. And here's our, here's our metaphor again, broader than the sea. Okay, so we need to understand that we are like little children. That's us, right, trying to communicate quantum cosmology, right? That's us with all of our sophisticated theological language is the equivalent of right, with an infinity beyond, with an eternity beyond. Is there things that we can know about God? Yes or no? Are there things that He has revealed? Yes or no? But are there limits to what that can actually reveal? Of course it can. And we need to be very clear right up front that in a very real sense, God is the unknown God. He is known to us. Of course, the fullest disclosure of who and what God is was revealed to us in the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. Amen? Amen. But language, words, have, they're clumsy. They have their limitations. They begin to stretch and they begin to break. One more passage from the Old Testament, then we'll look at another one from the New Testament. This is a, a favorite. It's from Psalm 145. Psalm 145. And verse 3. Psalm 145, verse 3. It says, Great is the Lord. Can you say amen to that? Amen. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. God deserves our praise. Amen. Amen. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. But notice this. Notice what the psalmist follows up with here. And His greatness is... What does your Bible say? Unsearchable. Yeah, unsearchable. His, great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. And here we're praising Him. And His greatness is... Here we are standing on the sea of the shore. The shore of the sea. His greatness is unsearchable, right? Can we fully apprehend the the limitlessness, the in illimitability of God, the e eternality of God? No. No, absolutely not. So when we come to the New Testament, okay, Paul, you've heard of him, right? He wrote a letter to a young man named Timothy. Okay, let's read the first of those letters. First Timothy chapter 3. Join me there. This will be our sort of final passage here to underscore this 
introductory point. 1 Timothy chapter 3, and we're going to read verse 16. 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. The Bible says, and without controversy, great is the mystery of, what does your Bible say? Great is the mystery of godliness. Now, when Paul employs this phrase here, without controversy, what he's saying is, this cannot be disputed. Without disputation, some translations say. No one can argue with the fact that the mystery of God and of godliness is awesome. He then begins to give an articulation of the central feature of that mystery, which is the incarnation, namely God becoming a man. He continues, God was manifested in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen by angels, preached among the Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up in glory. So the first thing that we want to lay down here as we're sort of, we have five presentations together, we're going to be talking about God as a trinity. Is God, is there one God? Yes or no? Okay. Is He singular in His godness? Yes. He alone is God. But God, we're going to see, is also revealed to us as a plurality, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We want to spend most of our time on the Holy Spirit because for the most part, we have a mental picture of God. Yeah, we got God. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. We've got a pretty good picture of the Son. We know the Father. We know the Son. We understand these roles and relationships. But who is this Spirit? Who and what is this? What's He about? What's His job? What does He look like? What's His role? But before we can spend too much time diving right into what the, the Spirit is and who the Spirit is and what the Spirit is, we first need to establish what does Scripture reveal about God in His nature and God in His character, okay? And before we can do that, we need to recognize that there are very significant, very serious, and very real limits of, what word am I going to say here? Limits of language, okay? So language has its limits. And we've looked at many passages here that basically say that. The secret things, they're for God. The things that are revealed, they're for us and our children. Without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness, right? Can you search out the, the, the limits of God? Of course not. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. How unsearchable is His greatness. So far, so good, everyone? So a very appropriate place for us to start in trying to put together our picture of who and what God is, and by, that, by the way, that's what the word theology means, the study of God, of God's revelation, of God's nature, of God's character, a very good place for us to start in a brief but systematic study of who and what God is would be in what book? I mean, where, if you were just going to start, where, where would you start? start? Let's start in Genesis. What chapter do you think we should start in? Let's just start in Genesis chapter 1. Go there with me if you would. Genesis chapter 1. And of course, we know these words right out of the gate. In the beginning, what? So we're introduced to God in the very first phrase of the very first verse of the very first chapter in Scripture, first book in Scripture. In the beginning, what did God do? In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And what we have here is a very wonderful, very beautiful, very poetic chronological laying out of God's creative acts. Day one, he did this, and day two, he did this, and day three, he did this, and day four, he did this. And as Moses is moving through, as God has shown him this in cinematic vision, as, as Moses is moving through in this beautiful passage of God's creative acts, he gets to the crowning act of God's creation, the top, the most important thing. It wasn't the hippopotamus, it wasn't the river, it wasn't the ocean, it wasn't the meadow, it wasn't the sea anemone. The crowning act of God's creation is that which was in His own image, mankind. And so we're going to look at that here in verse 26. Genesis chapter 1, verse 26. It says, then God said, let's and what does your Bible say there? That's a very interesting thing, isn't it? Now, us is a pronoun, right? And is that a plural or a singular pronoun? That's a plural pronoun, let us. Now, this is a little confusing in the English because God, which is the antecedent noun to us, is singular. 
right? I can see it right there. Then God said, God is in the singular, there's no S at the end. So there's my antecedent noun. It says, then God said, let, and here comes my pronoun, but it's not in the singular, it's in the... Now, why might that be? Well, the answer is that what appears singular to us in the English, God said, in the Hebrew is actually the word Elohim, which is in the plural. Elohim, plural. It would be the functional equivalent of our gods, right? But Moses, of course, is writing from a monotheistic perspective. We're going to get to that in just a moment. And so the singular in the English is retained appropriately. Then God said, let's us make man in, here comes another pronoun, plural possessive, our image according to our likeness. So three pronouns there. Let us make man in our image according to our likeness. Let, what, is it, what does your Bible say? Let them. them, is that plural or singular? That's plural, referring to Adam and Eve, mankind. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, over the birds of the air, and over the cattle over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created, what's our word there? Yeah. Them. Then God blessed them and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply. The very first command that God gives to the couple is to be fruitful and multiply, to make others. Now let's just try here to appreciate the significance of this. This is the first introduction that we have to God. I mean, right at the very beginning, Genesis chapter 1, we're introduced to God as creator, and we're introduced to God as not only creating the mountains and the meadows and the streams and the forests and the hippopotamus and the giraffes and the solar systems and the stars, he creates man, mankind, but when he creates mankind, he says, let us make man in our image, let them have dominion. When he creates a them, he creates a male and a female, that is to say two. How many, everyone? Two. And what's the first thing that he says to both of them? What's the first command he gives to them? Make another. Make another. Be fruitful, multiply. Make a family. Now, I want you just to imagine a very simple thing here. Imagine that this is a mirror. It's not. It's a book. But just imagine it's a mirror, okay? Now, if I have a mirror right here, okay, and I'm looking in the mirror just like this, now, let's say there's another person that's standing right here, okay? They're standing right here, and they're looking sort of at an angle here at the mirror, but I'm standing directly in front of the mirror. When that person looks at the mirror, this person here, what are they going to see in that mirror? Okay, okay, now be very careful what you say here. What are they going to see in the mirror? Let me ask a simpler question. Okay, you're correct when you say they see me. Okay, so here's a question. Is that me? Okay, what is that? That's a reflection or an image of me. Now, here's something very interesting about mirrors and images. That isn't me, but whatever is there is a very accurate picture of this because this is an image of this. Are you with me on that? So I'm going to ask you a simple question. According to Genesis 1, right here in the very beginning, we're just being systematic as we begin our study, five-part study. What was it that was in the image of God? Be more precise. Ah. Male and female, and what is the first command that God gives to them? Make another. So I'm going to say it this way. What God made in His image was a family. God made a family in His image. Now let's go back to our illustration here. If I'm looking in the mirror here, and there's a person standing right here, okay, is that image a very accurate reflection of me? Yes or no? Yes. Is the image me? No. no, but it's a reflection of me. So what do we see when we look in the image that God made of Himself in Genesis 1? What do we see there? We see a man and a... And God's saying to them, make a... Make another. We see a family in the image of God. Very interesting. Let us, plural, make man in our image, plural possessive, let them. I'm going to say something here that I think you'll get. Only a them could represent an us. Right? How could a he, singular, or just a she, singular, represent an us? 
No, 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 no. Let us make man in our image. Let, what's the word? Let them. A plural represents a plural. Okay, that's Genesis 1. But things get very interesting in Genesis 2. Join me there. Genesis 2. Just starting very slowly here, laying the groundwork. Are we going too fast? No, nice and slow. Genesis chapter 2. By the way, tomorrow night on... I'll be here tomorrow night. Are you going to be here tomorrow night? I will be here tomorrow night. I give you a solemn promise that as long as I'm still alive, I will be here tomorrow night. This program starts at... What time did we start tonight? Okay, you got it. Tomorrow night, after this program, there's another live program because 3 ABN does their live programs on Thursdays. And tomorrow night, it's my friend from the seminary at uh, Berrien Springs, Dr. Ronko Stefanovic, is doing a two-hour live program. And guess what his topic is? Holy Spirit, good guess. In a sense, it is. He's doing a two-hour live program on the Trinity. Amen. Tomorrow night, I'll be sitting there live. I'm going to go in there and make faces at him, try to get him to... <laughs> no, but anyway, the point is this. To me, it's such a... I didn't know that. He just stopped by my room today with Dr. Russell, and they had prayer with me, and they said, oh, we're here. We're recording some programs on the book of Matthew. And tomorrow night, he said, tomorrow night, I'm doing a program on the Trinity. I said, Ronco, I'm speaking about the Trinity tonight. He said, well, this must be very necessary. And let me tell you something, it is, and let me say it this way, it is important that we understand the Trinity and that we understand the nature of God, not because it's unclear, but because many of our own people and many well-meaning Christians out there just don't know what Scripture teaches. So when someone comes, perhaps a well-meaning person, perhaps even a sincere person, and puts a pamphlet or puts a tract or puts a CD in their hand that says, oh, this is pagan, oh, this is Catholic, oh, we can't believe this, and they don't know what Scripture actually teaches, they're led away by the nose into something that seems plausible and seems realistic, but what we want to do here and tomorrow night in Dr. Stefanovich's program, we want to look at anchors of... So that's what we're doing. We're just going through a very simple, very methodical study of Scripture, first understanding God and His nature, and then looking specifically at the Holy Spirit. Amen. We together, everyone? Yes. Genesis chapter 2. Genesis chapter 2, verse 7. Actually, we'll pick it up in verse 24. I was going to read verse 7. Let's just do this. Therefore, verse 24 of Genesis 2, Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and shall be joined to his wife, now watch this, and they, they, that's plural, shall become, what does your Bible say? One flesh. Okay, now this is a very important point here. The two become what? Okay, now I'm going to ask you a question. Is that a contradiction? Wait, I thought we were talking about two. Are we talking about two? But I thought we were talking about one. Are we talking about one? Well, which is it? One or two? Yes, is the answer, <laughs> right? Are we talking about two? Yes, we're talking about Adam and Eve, male and female. Two individuals, one family. The two, one flesh. And in that procreative union, that sexual union, another is created, which is the first thing that God had said to them. Be fruitful and multiply. Now, the word here for one, this is an important word, and we're going to come back to it tomorrow, but this is a, a, something for you to remember. The word here is the Hebrew word ekad. Ekad. And it means one, but it doesn't mean one in necessarily in the rigidly singular sense. Okay? That word is yakid. Yakid. This is the word ekad, which means one in terms of unity. In terms of what word did I say, everyone? Unity. Okay, because we have the man, we have the woman. There, how many is that? One plus one is, but when they come together, they become what? One. one flesh. So the two become, do we see plurality there? Do we see singularity there? We sure do. Genesis chapter 3. Join me. We're just going to walk through this. Genesis chapter 3. We might get one more passage in tonight. And uh, then we'll have set the groundwork very nicely, set the table very nicely for tomorrow night. Genesis chapter 3, verse 22. This is after uh, Adam has uh, partaken of the fruit, the, the wife Eve has partaken of the fruit, they have fallen into sin and rebellion. Verse 22, then the Lord God said, behold, the man 
has become like one of us to know good and evil. And now lest he put forth his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever. Therefore the Lord God sent him out of the garden of Eden. So behold, the man has become like one of us. Okay, so here's a fascinating thing. We are introduced to God right at the very beginning. I mean, at the very outset of Scripture as one God who is also an us. Do we see singularity? God said, yes. But do we also see plurality? Yes. And we see it most strikingly in the thing that God makes in His image. This is the mirror. God is essentially saying, hey, this is what I'm like. Do you want to know what I'm like? And we're going to pick that up tomorrow night. This is the most beautiful, glorious, life-transforming picture of who and what God is. Because when we get to the New Testament, John, John the Apostle, is going to say three of the most phenomenally beautiful words in all of the English language when put in juxtaposition. He's going to say, that's many thousands of years future yet, but this is where, he's, this is where Scripture is headed. God is love. Not merely loving, which would be an adjective describing a behavior. God is, in His very nature, in His very essence, God is, what's our word? Love. But wait a minute. Love, by definition, is the principle of putting others first. Yeah? That's love right? Love seeketh not its own. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 5. Greater love hath no man than this, that a man would lay down his life for his... So, love by definition has others. Are you with me on that? Now, hear it again. God is what? Love. If love is the principle of putting others first, then what by definition do we have to have in order to have love? Got to have others. And that's where we're headed with this. So, right here at the outset... In, in Genesis chapter 1 and 2, we're introduced to God, right? God the creator, God the sovereign, and he says, let us make man in our image. Here's a mirror that God can show to the angels and God can show to the other planets and to the other universe. Hey, this is what I'm like. Now, why would God have to create something in his image? I don't have time to unpack this, but the short version is because of the limits of language, because of the limits of language and of analogy and of, because God is so totally awesome, so totally different, so totally amazing, he creates a thing and says, well, this is what I'm like. This is what I'm like. But the question is, is what was that that he made in his image? What was that thing that he made in his image? Was it just males? Are males in the image of God and not females? No. Are females also in the image of God? So what is it that God made in his image? He made a family. He made a man. He made a woman. And the very first thing he said to them was, make another. Are we beginning to lay the groundwork here for our time together? Yes. We're talking tonight about the mystery of God, singularity and plurality. We have effectively set the table. All the pieces are on the table. The silverware is there. The plates are there. And tomorrow we're going to continue to set the table and then we'll start eating the meal. But let me tell you, the picture that emerges the picture of God is so beautiful, so stirring, and so uniquely Christian that it will just melt your heart. It is so profoundly beautiful. And what's more than that, it's not only beautiful, it's true. Mm -hmm.